Hello and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today we present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast event. During our event today, the topic will be Introduction to Cisco TrustX Solution and Configuration with Cisco Expert on Kerr Bajaj. My name is Francine Richards and I'm the Web Marketing Project Manager for the Cisco Support Community. Our expert joining us today is Ankur Bajaj. Ankur is a customer support engineer from the AAA team at the Cisco Technical Assistance Center in Richardson, Texas. He has 14 years of total experience, and he has worked on a wide range of Cisco security technologies such as Cisco ASA, VPN deployments, NAC solution, ACS, and ISC deployment. Ankur has CCIE 22135 in security. Welcome, Ankur. And joining on for today are Faye Ann Lee, Bo Wallace, and Renal Josh Wall. Faye Ann Lee is a technical marketing engineer for Cisco. Renal Josh Wall has been with Cisco since 2007 with previous experience as a software developer. He works with AAA and wireless technical assistance and holds a CCIE in security 31389, MCSA in 2003 track, MCAD in .NET, GNIIT from, NN, from NIIT. And Bo Wallace is an engineer for the RTP AAA TAC team, supporting multiple solutions, including ISC, TrustSec, 802.1, among other technologies. And now let's take a moment to review some upcoming events that are taking place on the community and may be of interest to you. We have a very special expert VIP webcast coming up on January 13th, Troubleshooting SIP in Cisco Unified Communications Deployments. Cisco designated VIP DJ will discuss how the session initiation protocol is redefining our UC world. Don't miss this special event and you can register at the link provided in the chat window. And before we get started with the event today, remember you may download a copy of today's PDF presentation using the link in the chat window. And in addition to the upcoming VIP webcasts, we also have some Ask the Expert events currently running on the community, including application-centric infrastructure and digital media suite configuration and troubleshooting. You can join these Ask the Expert events at the link provided in your chat window. There will also be an Ask the Expert event that will open up after the conclusion of this event today on Cisco TrustSec. You can participate in that at the link provided in your chat window. Now, I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's expert series webcast. Ankur will start with this presentation for the first 60 minutes of the program, and then we'll dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit questions to be answered by Ankur and the team of Cisco technical experts using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your console. The team of technical experts is well-versed in Cisco TrustX, so please begin posting your questions now to give them the best chance of answering them. And also, if you experience any technical issues during today's broadcast, please post your question in the chat. Now, let's get started with our event today, and we'll start off with the polling question for our audience. What are the various ways of controlling network-based access? A, VLAN assignment. B, DACL assignment from Radius server. C, role-based access control, D, security group tag, E, all of them, or F, none of them. So if you'll take a moment to answer this, it will give our experts an opportunity to tailor today's presentation to meet your needs. And do make sure to submit your questions as we'll answer them later in the webcast. And now I would like to hand the mic over to Ankur, who will start the, today's presentation. So here is the agenda of today's presentation. We will discuss in detail the foundation concept of TrustSec, and then a classification, assignment, and transport of security group tag, what is network device admission control and MACSEC, and configuration on iOS and ICE, and we will also have a look on AnyConnect VPN on ESA with SGP assignment. So introduction to TrustSec. Um, so TrustSec initially was a term used mostly for everything in an entity network, but now this term is rebranded and now referred for SGT, which is security group tagging and MACSEC. So 
So this slide talks about the goals of FlushSec, which is primarily RBAC. It's role-based access control, and it's behavior to, throughout the network. Now we already have role-based access control, which are local to access ports or wireless sessions on your network access devices. But the difference with TrustSec is that it influences the policy upstream to the network from access edge towards the data center and can be leveraged by multiple devices on the way to the destination resource to enforce and permit or deny. So in other words, we can assign tag to user or devices at the ingress and then enforce and access anywhere else in the network which makes it egress enforcement. It also has an impact on user-to-user -user segmentation, being able to take users in the same VLAN and, and isolate the traffic by having traffic tag values associated to the users in the same VLAN. Or it can also go to VPN connection uh, so some of these points we're going to discuss in the config slides through your configuration examples, and uh, hopefully that from there it will be more clear. So this is a typical diagram showing eyes providing context-based policy for different endpoints coming into the network, whether it is wired or wireless, coming as a corporate user or a guest. We can create a context using profiling, use posture status, uh, BYOD certificate provisioning. And uh, on the basis of um, uh, of these results of these dynamic access and all other pieces, we will uh, we will provide uh, access policy. And I mean, all these pieces work well and they're quite widely deployed. So from this slide, we are going to discuss how this deployment can even be more powerful with SGT. Now, in addition to all the normal things happening during the dynamic access session, like device type, role of the employee, whether it is trusted or untrusted, we are going to leverage all the same information that is required to make authorization profile decision and add to it a security group tag. So security group tag is a 16-bit value that is sent back to the network access device. It is part of the radius access exit message, and it is added to the session state for the endpoint session. Either, either it can be wired or wireless. And that information is sent upstream into the network so that other devices further at the WAN edge um, our campus distribution or back at data center can make a policy uh, solely based on the security group tag. And this helps significantly in reducing the ACLs. And it pretty much makes the policy consistent wherever the user goes into the network. So if you don't have plus sec, you are on the traditional way to segment the network, which generally means different VLANs, which also means DHCP scopes have to be set up. Uh, and all the policies for the, those different VLANs have to be configured. And because this is IT-based, it has to be replicated or removed as sites or devices are added or removed from the organization. Um, so uh, another traditional approach is English ACL or DACL, but the number of ACE entries in an ACL is an issue. So the formula to calculate the number of ACE entries is the number of source multiplied by number of destination and multiplied by number of permission is equal to number of ACE entries. So if you have one source with six destination and four permission, that makes it like 24 access control entries. And uh, secondly, another issue is that ACL gets loaded into an executor from TCAM. And the access layer switches have limited amount of TCAM, which is usually assigned for ASIC. So this is another issue with ACL approach. So here is a driving point. Why isn't port-based um, or 
ingress port based access control sufficient now vlan and dacls are great construct to apply policy to the ingress port but apart from some points we discussed in the earlier slide main difference is that security group tag travels so security so sgd after being uh, assigned through the authorization policy will propagate upstream to the network all devices who are interested in knowing about it can uh, receive the information and if they're capable of enforcing policy they can make a forwarding decision based solely on source uh, source group tag and the destination group tag now if you uh, if you add plus seg we can flatten the network we can make simpler policy structures uh, for VLAN and IP subnet. We can place the user in the same VLAN and provide a fully distributed and differentiated access control. And this is because the tag has meaning beyond the access port of the endpoint. And it is really and it really helps to create consistent policy, no matter whether you are coming from uh, from a network which is wired or Wi-Fi or remote access VPN. We have a fairly consistent access control policy. It is important to note here is that the endpoint is not aware of the tag, and the tag is, um, I mean, is only known to the network uh, infrastructure. Uh, stressing on the same point of uh, consistency on this slide, irrespective of uh, any of the three access methods, and this uh, consistency is primarily because we are pushing the same SGT value of 55. So if you have a server in the data center and we will assign a tag to it, say 100, and uh, let's say I will design my uh, authorization policy that if each chaining is successful and if the end user is posture compliant then I will um, assign a tag of say 55 and the access from source tag 55 to destination tag 100 is permit else deny all so whether I am on wireless or wired this policy is consistent this also extends to the data center and one of the benefit is is that when you add a resource to the data center or if we duplicate or replicate these um, these these resources as long as they're classified as a particular security group so so yeah so basically if I add five servers to data center then all of them will be assigned the tag as hundred and the same consistent policy will apply. In terms of firewall, uh, there are benefits too. Now let's say we have a company with three sites and each site will have different subnets. Um, hence you will need to duplicate the policy between those three sites and on top of that you, um, for each user you have a differentiated access to the data center resource. So uh, now if we, if we have to add a site or if we have to add a res new resource to the data center, then you will have to tweak or reconfigure the policy and make sure that it applies to all sites out there. And if you remove a site or a resource from DC, then everything same applies in the reverse order. And hence, each organization will have to allocate a resource to add or clean old policy. So the point here is that SGT also helps in cleaning old policy entries when resources or sites are removed. And with SGT, we can significantly reduce the staff required to maintain hundreds of firewall and ACL entries and uh, use them some, somewhere else. So with TrustSec, we are talking about three primary topics, um, which is HGT classification, enforcement, and then transport. Classification here is all about how you identify these endpoints as they are coming onto your network. And the endpoints could be servers, this could be 
There could be endpoints that are not capable of dynamic authorization. There may be mobile devices, printers, cameras, etc. Et so we classify them using the best method we can, or we do a static classification in which we can manually go and assign a tag to the resources in the network. Then comes enforcement, which is all about how we make forwarding decisions and how we leverage the tag assigned to influence the policy in terms of um, making a permit or a denied decision. Also, not all net devices are capable of enforcing an SGACL policy, and there are some devices who can receive and propagate information, but they themselves cannot take action and rely on other devices upstream to make a decision based on information they propagate. Uh, next thing is transport, which is also referred to propagation, which means how to move the information on the network. Uh, all three of these are, been, are the building blocks, and I will stress one point here is that during your design phase, one really needs to research the environment and understand the capability of a particular platform with respect to these three areas, classification, enforcement, and propagation, or and refer it to as transport. Because it, all these three changes release by release, so look for as much feature parity as possible, and it is hardware or ASIC dependent. Let's talk more on these building blocks. This slide talks about classification type, dynamic versus static, and we have listed some of the static classification types available for reference. And with studies, and with static classification, we are assigning the tag to either IP address, VLAN, subnet, etc. And uh, static classification in, is common. Uh, where servers are connected to access ports or there is a third-party deployment like, for example, if we have a Linksys wireless gear which does not understand SGT, then we can statically map VLAN to SGT for WLAN on Linksys and make this mapping happen. With dynamic classification, we have the three classic methods that we support uh, and uh, and dynamic classification happen when you assign a tag based on authentication result, and this can either happen because of dot one x map a bot or um, and the trustsec five dot zero we have the ability to assign a tag to a VPN user as well. This tag assignment can occur either at the VPN connection or as, or as a result of change of authorization co op. Once the tag is assigned to a VPN user, then we can enforce the traffic based on the tag either locally on the ASA using SG firewall or propagate the SGD via SXP on the network edge device and do an enforcement there. Now, I do realize that I'm using some, um, some terms like SXP and SG firewall, which we have not discussed, so just keep them in mind and uh, we're going to go in details in the, com in, in the coming slides and configuration. So um, here, is we, uh, here is the flow of dynamic classification. We got a typical supplicant, a search or a controller, and eyes. And we see a heap from uh, supplicant to switch controller and then further encapsulated in a, a radius packet to the eyes. You can do either dot one x map or bot. But the bottom line is that the eyes authenticate the endpoint and then comes to authorization policy decision. And based on the selected policy returns things like VLAN, tackle, and in this case, security group tag. So the SGD is sent in the radius attribute with access exit packet to the NAS device and is added to the session state for that endpoint. And if configured to do so and also capable, um, the network access device will propagate this information throughout the network. But the show command show CTS role-based SGD map will provide current mapping available on the switch locally um, and also 
IP device tracking needs to be enabled for IP to tag mapping to happen. Here are some of the static classification options listed. These options differ with platform like, for example, layer 3 interface to SGD mapping is only available on 6500. And uh, also your subnet to SGD mapping is not available on all platforms. And VLAN to SGD mapping and IP to SGD map uh, tag value is fairly common on all switching platforms. Hence, it is important to know which platform and what feature we are looking for. The next one is transporting the SGT. Now, once you uh, get cl uh, classification information, how you transport or propagate it to the rest of the network is something we will see now. So one of the ways to transport SGT is to use SXP, which is Security Group Exchange Protocol. And one of the use case of SXP is if you have a device which is not capable of imposing tags to the layer 2 frame. And this is called inline tagging, and we will discuss that in the coming slides. A typical example of these devices are 3560s or 3750-non-X uh, series, and these devices, devices cannot read or apply the tag to the frame but they can learn the classification and send it upstream to the network using SXP. So SXP is a IP TCP based protocol and its port number is 64999. And its basic function of uh, this protocol is to let the other sites know about the mapping achieved through classification. The slide has an example of the inline tagging and we can uh, take a look at the packet, we have 10.1.100.98, and it has been assigned the tag of 50, and its source is local, and it's directly connected to the layer 2 port of the campus switch. Um, so we have learned about this mapping, and we can send this information using SXP to another device in the core. Um, and it can be via any non-SXP capable device. Another point is that there can be any number of non-SGT capable devices in between as it is, as it is just a TCP uh, packet and any capable, any IP capable cloud can carry it. But when it reaches the device capable of imposing the tag, then I can take the tag information and write the tag directly to the header and transport it that way inside the frame. And it gets processed this way by each trust tag capable hop and reapplied on its way to, towards the destination. Uh, so once you reach the peer L2 SGD capable boundary, you can transport the tag in a layer 2 frame. And from there, the core will not know about the non trust tag capable devices on the source side. And it is going to have the information inside the frame it receives. And it can make forwarding decision if it's capable and reapply the tagging when it moves to the next hop. So plus-sec inline tagging can be used with or without max-sec. And MaxSec here is 802.1 AE based hop by hop encryption method uh, applied between two MaxSec capable switching devices. And the intent here is to protect the content of the tag from sniffing and tapping. So there is a command type registered by Cisco called CMD, which is ether type 8909 for carrying the tag. So this slide uh, shows the packet when SGT is wrapped inside the MaxSec. And there's a tag overhead, and consideration should be taken that MTUs are sufficient on the carrier boundaries for it. Another polling question, and it is easy one as we just said it, is MaxSec mandatory configuration for SGT propagation? 
and I'm going to pause for a few seconds here. I'm got it right. Um, so next from our network device admission control, and it's a way to apply authentication and authorization for network devices jo joining a common NDAC domain. Um, so in our NDAC domain, um, we have a switch which will be acting as an authenticator for another switch, where, which will be exactly the same as an 82.1x applicant. And they use this EPFAST um, as authentication protocol, and uh, it receives the back files from our ICE node. So once authenticated, it can also receive information from, uh, from ICE node if the other switch is trusted or not. And this is something which we do in the configuration of the ICE, where there is a box on the SGT section within, the, within our network device screen, and that, that box indicates whether the device should be trusted by others or not. Now, by, by this, uh, it, we don't mean that if uh, that authentication will pass or fail based on that configuration. But if we, but if the device is not trusted, then any tag that it sends will be overridden by the device tag and uh, propagate in the L2 frame. So this concept is important, and it's not just common with NDAC, uh, but it's there with other configuration also. And uh, this is something that I'll show you in the ICE config. Um, so just keep tuned for this concept. Another thing is that the first device that's going to join the network and authenticate is the seed device, and it uh, establishes initial communication. And that device will have a cascading effect as you start joining nodes. So they will basically mutually authenticate each other, and that will continue till the edge of the network. Um, and another thing to note here is that one important requirement for NDAC is to have your radius server up all the time. Um, uh, so your ISPSN node typically will going to be act as your radius server, and if the radius server is down, then the link can go down very fast. Uh, so uh, this, just keep this in mind. So apart from this concept of NDAC, another use case scenario for NDAC is when you're looking for uh, pushing things like security group name, um, things like security group ACL or keying material for MACSEC encryption from IC tools. So as we discussed in the previous slide, MACSEC is a 802.1 AE standard, and it's basically a hub-by-hub -hub encryption. So what it means is that packet will be decrypted at each hop, and it happens at a wire rate, and then inspected, routed, and re-encrypted on its way further upstream. And um, we can negotiate this dynamically using the NDAC, or you can configure manually using CTS manual. Uh, I mean, with, with, we, we can manually configure what level of encryption we used and provide the key material, uh, material statically on both sides. Uh, this slide talks about NDAC, which is uh, CTS.1x, and also it talks about CTS manual configuration with and without encryption. Um, in our day-to-day -day life in TAC, we have seen that CTS manual is widely used configuration for SGT propagation. And the reason is that with, C with your NDAC or your CTS.1x, like we just discussed, we need to take into consideration the AAA state. So um, as, a, as your AAA state, if, if it goes down, the link can go fast, uh, can go down very fast. So some of the customers might not like it. Uh, other customers might want to configure things like load balancing and make sure your AAA is reachable all the time. Another uh, thing with NDAC is that some of the platforms like our ASR 1K and Nexus 5K, uh, it doesn't support NDAC, and uh, we, we have the option of CTS manual only over there.
So uh, this is a cps.monx config snip on a layer 3 interface. And if we do show CTS interface command, we see um, CTS is enabled. Um, and it's uh, and its mode is dot one x. We also see things like auth c and auth z is successful, which is um, our authentication and authorization is going good. Um, we also see things like peer identity, peer SGT value, and if it's trusted or not. As per our discussion in the last slide, we need to check that box to make it trusted. Um, also, we'll see what is the negotiated cipher method used your SAP status, is it a success, which it should be, uh, if life is good. And uh, the SPI, which is our service point index values for your transmitted and received traffic. So this is your manual mode. And uh, we have defined the SAP PMP key here and the mode list, which is GCM encrypt, or we can also just make it null and do nothing there. Um, SAP is a security association protocol, and it is the, I mean, it, it's, it's an encryption key derivation and exchange protocol. A PMK is our pairwise master key, and uh, with CTS manual, they both can be manually configured between the two interfaces um, using the SAP PMP, uh, PMP uh, command that we have used in this config. Uh, we also see the show CTS interface. Um, and here, your authentication and auth Z is not applicable as everything is uh, going to be manual. But uh, what we are interested really to look at apart from that is uh, if the propagate SGT is enabled and the IFC state of the port should be initialized. So uh, from this slide, uh, we are we're going to start the configuration of iOS. And firstly, we do a traditional AAA new model to enable AAA on the iOS. Uh, we're going to defi define the, the radius server with the PAC key. Um, that's going to be defined because it is a E-first communication to ICE, uh, and the PAC is provisioned and dynamically it's going to be stored as part of the device credentials for, uh, for other trust check related authentication and authorizations. Uh, we will configure CTS authorization list and uh, and assign an ID value to ID value to it. Uh, we also configure AAA authentication for dot one X and then create a AAA authorization network list with with the same value that is configured for CTS authorization list. And this uh, command and config is necessary to pull your uh, tag information in the XF accept packet. I'm just going to close this. So this is like your bootstrapping for virus. So uh, the same uh, traditional dot one X system of config to be enabled, and that is required basically to have dot one X enabled globally on the iOS. We will define vendor specific attributes to be sent during authentication. Um, then we define CTS credentials for the NAS, which is your device ID and the password. And uh, this information needs to match what we have defined on the trust sec within the network device section of ICE. And in case it, I mean, if it does not match, then we have seen the device will not authenticate. And um, I can show you in, in in the config of eyes that will put the same credentials that we do here to make the authentication to go further. Now, if you're successfully authenticated to eyes, then the first thing to do is to check the pack. And if we have the pack file, then life is good. Um, 
issue the command show CTS back, and here we will see the back info, and we basically see uh, we're looking for AID info here, and the uh, and the lifetime, and uh, match it to the eyes. You can edit this information on AID uh, for AID information if um, if the design is like that. Um, so if you go into the eyes protocol section within the settings of for the EFAS, uh, you can edit it, and same will be pushed to the NAS device, and you can match the two entries. From fact, the next thing to check is the environmental data, and all section highlighted here is important. So it it shows all of the SG radius server defined on the ice. Uh, we also see SGT tag or device tag uh, from ice server assigned. And on the slide, the SGT tag value is listed as 2-0-0. So it is based on the network device authorization policy that are configured on the policy egress, policy security tag section on ICE. And that's something I'm going to show you uh, in the ICE section. Um, we also see any security group that are known, and uh, this is how you are name to name, uh, num I mean, the name to number binding becomes known. And, uh, and we see this reference of what uh, the number maps to name so that we can use it further. Another important thing is the timers here. Um, it's, 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 it's important for this re uh, reference then when the environmental data expire, when was it refreshed, and what is the last update time. So this configuration slide goes into um, activating enforcement. And the enforcement can be applied using centrally defined SGACL on the ICE uh, at the time of device authentication. Uh, this SGACL will be downloaded. And that scales very well. And that's how we see most of the customer uh, implemented. Um, also shown in this slide, what we can do is statically map IP to SGT uh, on switches itself, even though it does not scale, but it can be a good use case to test in the initial phase of the deployment um, when you are defining your SG ACLs on the ICE. Um, and we recommend that we can enforce them uh, you know, uh, during that phase. Also, it's going to be good for static servers, which you know that they're not going to move much. Uh, we can use this um, feature. Um, so, but if you are enabling SG ACL globally for a VLAN, uh, we use this CTS role-based enforcement command to have them enforced to a specific VLAN. Uh, but just make sure that you enable CTS role-based enforcement first before applying them to any VLAN list, because I've seen in a couple of cases where uh, everything was good, but since your enforcement was not set globally, we were not able to push and bind the SG ACLs to a particular VLAN list. Uh, this is your SXP configuration, and we need to enable SXP on all the platforms, including ACS. It is a good practice to, to define a CTS SXP default password. And yeah, and the CTS SXP connection peer needs to be uh, manually defined on both the peer devices. And here we will, uh, when we define this command, we will define a peer device IP, which is the IP which is going to receive this exchange, and the source IP. Also, you can define the mode here. Uh, here on this example, it's local, but you can tweak it. And you can define it as a speaker or a listener, as for your network design and uh, where that device is placed. Uh, this is a show CTS connection brief, and it's uh, used to determine which peering 
connection are established. Um, uh, and this command can isolate some of the things during troubleshooting, like if peering IP is incorrect, or if both the ends are configured for speaker or listener. You can uh, also do uh, a show CTS role based SGT map. Um, and it will basically show you this, the current mapping details of what IP to tag binding are known, um, what is the source they are learned from, and either it is SXP or it's internal. So quite useful commands while we do troubleshooting on SXP. So debugging on the switch, if we want to really troubleshoot attributes corresponding to environmental data and, or C, CTS authorization events or debug CTS as a whole with AAA. And uh, I'll, I'll suggest you to call us before enabling these debugs if uh, you are on production. But if you are on POCs, on your labs, just feel free to enable all of them. And it will give you some quite robust um, CTS exchanges uh, for reference. So let's talk about ICE configuration on uh, 1.3. Um, so step one and two is like a bootstrap to a RICE for TrustSec. And the first thing is to go and create some security groups. And um, we have already uh, seen on the previous slides that we can define some statically on the switch itself. Uh, but this is a, on the ICE, here's the place we can do. So. Here on the slide, we have defined um, a name called add device underscore SGT, and you can optionally give a description. Um, another important thing here is that the tag number listed here in decimal and hexadecimal format, and it's uh, determined by the ICE automatically. And in some of the show commands, you will see this uh, number being mapped to your group name on your switches. So step three, uh, configuration is to define your network device authorization. Uh, it's under policy, trust check, network device authorization. Uh, and now every device in the trust check domain will have, a um, will have a device security group tag. Uh, here on this slide, I have defined a default one, or you can create specific conditions around it and then, defi and then define that Tag in this case is device underscore SGT. But overall, our um, end goal with this config is that each device will receive a tag uh, as part of its authentication uh, from ICE. And then we go to step four, um, where your configuration is optional if you want to define or not. And if you recall, um, we discussed the AID information, and this is a place wherein you can go within the EAP setting. And um, and define your uh, authority identity information description. And once you do a show environmental command or show pack, this is what it's going to match from the ICE. Step five is to go and create your network device entry and put a name and an IP address, and also optionally define the model name or software version, it's like any network device that you add, uh, pretty much all same things, attributes that you can use further in your authorization policy. Uh, step six, uh, again, you, we need to define a radius shared secret. It's not listed on the slide, but uh, option above this is a, your radius secret. And then comes the, your, your real section, your extra section. Uh, where it's referred to your advanced trust sec configuration. And it's here that you will find specification of your device ID. And uh, if, if you check this, it's going to be uh, grayed out and cannot be changed. But if, you, uh, but if you uncheck it, you will have option to put, the, put any, anything that you want. Uh, then we'll basically put our password, which needs to match with what we have defined on the switch, like we discussed in the pre previous slide on the switch side. Um, there is another checkbox, if you see here, uh, 
for other trust-like devices to trust this device. And this is, again, as per our previous discussion of NDAC or CTS.connect, if you, if you don't check this box, then PAG is not going to be trusted, and it's pretty much going to be overridden um, as, as, as your peer is going to receive it on the port. So your authenticate, authenticating switch is going to impose its own tag if you don't check it. So again, it's up to your design, but this is one uh, feature that is available on ICE, and it's also used on different uh, trust-like deployments. So this is ICE-specific uh, configuration when you are using NDAC, wherein we can specify multiple TrustSec AAA server and uh, define the IP. And if you re recall your show environmental data, this is going to be downloaded on the local device table of the switch. And uh, we will see the same output if you do that command again. So this is the configuration about uh, security group ACL for enforcement, and it is like it's like a DACL config on ICE. But uh, make sure that the syntax that we use here it's valid. Else, uh, we have seen issues where when your SGACL will will fail to load or it's going to fail to execute its operation. So it's IPv4. We pretty much do a format for a protocol TCP and go at destination defined there. So in order for us to do something with that ACL, we need to map it to a security group. So we will create a, a security group as shown in this slide. We go to policy, security group access, egress policy, and create a security group tag for that role. And then uh, we apply the security group to the security group ACL. And um, there are different ways that uh, we can achieve this. And uh, this slide shows one of the ways wherein uh, we go to the egress policy screen and then add the security group binding to a specific, uh, I mean, by we, we basically specify the source and the destination tag and the associated SGACL. Now, you can do optional description there. If you see the status, uh, it's enabled. You can also click on the drop down and uh, specify the monitor mode, uh, which is going to be like an authentication open if we have to compare on dot one X. And uh, during a phase deployment in the monitor mode, you might want to keep it in the monitor till you, till you go to the next mode. So you have that option available here. Uh, and another way to assign, we can also assign the SGACL by going through the metrics. So if you click on the metrics, um, the way it will work is that you, you basically go and click on any one of the cell, and uh, it's going to match the horizontal and the vertical map and prompt us to add uh, SGACL for the source and the destination tag. Finally, to get this tag associated to the endpoint, we create an authorization policy, like we do in most of the config on ICE. Uh, we can create a condition um, like uh, I have created a very simple one. You can mix and match with AD posture, and then once all that is met, then assign a security group tag to it. So and another polling question for you guys. Uh, does TrustSec provide a scalable and enhanced role-based access uh, control? And I guess the answer should be pretty clear after things we discussed. So I'm just going to pause for a few seconds here.
So hopefully everyone got that also right. Um, so we are going to discuss uh, configuration pertaining to remote access AnyConnect VPN on ESA with the security group, uh, group tag assignment. Um, the tag assignment on ESA is introduced around 921, and it also supports change of authorization. And uh, uh, we, we are changing the tag value with a COA request. Um, in these slides, we are not going to discuss details of um, our SSL, NAT, or group policy part of the configuration. But we'll discuss TrustSec and how it uh, binds to those VPN-related policies. We're also going to discuss security group firewall um, and its integration with them. So uh, this is our use case scenario. Here uh, we have two AnyConnect users uh, connecting, and um, one is RCH underscore user, one is RTP underscore user. Um, and, uh, and the flow is that we want to allow traffic between them, basically do uh, U-turning of traffic over VPN. And this traffic needs to be enforced by the security group uh, firewall, and we want to allow ICMP for RTP user to our internal server 1.1.1.1, and also allow uh, RCH users for internal server 2.2.2.2, and deny access from RCH user to uh, inside server farm called Kalos service, and allow the access uh, to RTP user to RC RCH user only. and uh, basically allow everything else. If you see this network topology, we also have this ASA at the edge of the data center, and it's connected to a Nexus device. So if we want to set up SXP peering with it, we can do that um, and, uh, and propagate the SXP, I mean, propagate your SGT information uh, through SXP on Nexus and maybe do enforcement there. So the first thing uh, with TrustSec on ASA is that we will have to disable the feature called SysOp connection from a VPN. And uh, this is a very old command. and it's being used with traditionally with VPN to bypass the ACL check on the outside interface of the firewall after your packet is decrypted on it. But uh, with TrustSec on ASA, it's going to create an issue because the security group firewall that we plan to introduce in this section uh, is, is, is applied using uh, the interface-based ACL. So if this command is issued, it's going to break it because that ACL check is going is is um, is neglected if this with this command. So we would we don't want that bypass to happen. Another thing is that if we want URL redirection to work uh, on this with things like posture, then we still need uh, ACL for redirection to be hit, and this command again is going to bypass that ACL check. So first thing is just remove this command. And in this use case, uh, we are referring to a traffic flow between the two users on, who are going to land up on the same interface. So we need a command called same security traffic permit intra interface. So it's going to allow the U-turning of the traffic from the interface where your crypto maps are applied for in case of IPsec or if where your web VPN is enabled in case of SSL. The next step is to create the object group, security group name, and a tag value. So again, as per our use case scenario, in this, uh, we are making three object names and then defining associated security group name and a tag. Uh, let's say for RTP, RCH, and Kalo services respectively. And uh, all these three information is, is our building block of our security group firewall. 
So SU firewall, like we discussed, is an enforcement on ASA. Um, so with ASA, we are kind of moving forward and then coming back in on the flow with ASA um, as we compare it to our discussion with switch. So I just wanted to highlight to the audience here. So so there is no confusion. So it's just the flow of this uh, slide. I'm going on enforcement first, and then I'm going to come on um, uh, your uh, propagation and classification also. So once this is done, um, we will create a firewall policy uh, using the ACLs. So we will configure access list, out channel score access, and uh, we can use either your security group name, like I have done, or you can also do tag numbers uh, that we have configured in the previous slide. So here we are allowing ICMP for security group name RTP user and RCH, RCH user to two servers as per our network topology. And, and then doing a deny to RCH, RCH user and allowing the RTP users to the Kalo servers. Um, and then we want a permit all, and we will use a access group command like we use in the firewall to map it. So the point here is that um, if there are hundreds of users that are coming in, and as long as they are part of this security group name, these ACLs are going to cater all of them. So in those respect, it scales very well with firewall. And that is what we want to showcase on this um, config slide. So stepping back a little bit, this is like bootstrapping your AAA on, on uh, ASA. So we enable AAA server with a name. And in this case, we say ICE. Uh, we define a protocol radius and enable dynamic authorization for your uh, COA exchange to happen. Uh, we enable interim accounting update, uh, which is going to enable multiple uh, session accounting for VPN. Um, and this uh, and and with this command of interim accounting records, we are going to send your interim records to the PSN, and this will be in addition to your normal start and stop records. Um, we will also configure things like authorize only mode. To, uh, to eliminate the, uh, the need of including radius common password uh, for radius authorization server, which normally you do on the radius authorization server. It's in the AAA server config. Uh, last but not the least, uh, we will enable CTS server group and bind the uh, AAA server name to it and needs to match. So in this case, it's going to be ICE. Step seven is our propagation path, and uh, it, it is to enable SXP to forward your IP to SGT binding to any inside device on your core or, or in your data center. And if you recall on the network topology, uh, we, are, we had a nexus on a data center edge. So we can pretty much use the, your CTS SXP command on the ASA and uh, enable SXP. And um, we need to give a default password and define the peer IP address. And um, in this case, the mode of the peer device is going to be a listener. Step eight is to call the AAA server that we have defined. Uh, group name is ICE on your tunnel group general attribute configuration. Um, and this server group ICE is going to bind for all three AAA functions, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Um, also, in the last step nine, we have enabled inspection of ICMP here. Uh, it's not mandatory. It's just for this use case for these two, two VPN users to, uh, to work and do a, a U-turning. Uh, so this is the I site config for SGT for ASA. 
So instead of defining the security group name and value on that we discussed on step three on ASA, we can define the same on the ICE and uh, push it using your authorization policy. Uh, this is something we have also done in switch side config. So we can go to uh, policy, policy elements, results, and security group access. And then within the security group, go and add it. And uh, we can give the group name. And just to maintain cons consistency, I've given the same name and the value, uh, which is RCH and RTP. If you see this uh, option with ICE 1.3, we also have um, introduced options of import and export. So we can do bulk import or export of this data through the CSV file uh, to and from the ICE database, which is a cool feature to have. So here is a config of authorization policy to push the tag we have created. Um, I created a rather simple condition to just match the user uh, radius username and then assign a security group name that was uh, created in our previous step. Uh, we have seen customers do a combination of conditions here like your tunnel group name, you can do plus AD group membership or posture st status and if all of this is met then um, assign a security group permission. So, uh, so uh, this is your pack configuration. So, in in order of, uh, to join a trusted cloud, uh, the ASA needs to authenticate with your pack, which is protected access credential. Um, our ASA does not support automatic pack provisioning, which is why uh, that the file needs to be manually generated on ICE and uh, imported to the ASA. So if I go to the ICE configuration, go to administration and uh, network resources within your network device if you choose ASA. Um, again, we go into the advanced trust spec option. And uh, over there, there's an option called out of band SGA pack. And then uh, click on generate pack. And in this config, I've set it for one year. Uh, and you will get a prompt to download the file. And uh, that file will have all the pack information that we need to export to ASA. So yeah, once once we have the file, it needs to be imported to ASA, and uh, uh, we can put the pack file to either HTTP or FTP server, and then use this uh, CTS import command to import it to the firewall. Um, we will see a message of pack import successful once it's uh, done correctly. Uh, and you will also uh, see this output if you do a show, uh, show CTS pack command. And uh, the same things that we are going to look for is AID and the validity time, uh, similar to things that we see on the switch. So once you have the correct pack file, the ASA automatically performs a seek environmental refresh. Uh, and this is going to download the information from ICE about your current SGT groups. And um, if you see this output of the command show CTS environmental data, uh, for the SGTV table, we will see uh, your security group names that were created on ICE, RTP, and RCH. And uh, with a corresponding uh, security group number and the type, which is unicast. So if you see this good, we know that your pipe, the pack is good and the refresh is happening properly. So once a VPN is established, uh, we can use the traditional VPN command like show VPN session DB any connect to verify and we can see that uh, ASA has presented an SGT group 
which is like combination of your uh, security group name and the value, and it's applied to each session. Um, we will, of course, see other VPN-related attributes also on this command, like your user ID, your assigned IP from the pool, the timers, your Rx, Tx values, etc. So fairly good command. So the same command, uh, I mean, the pre previous output was for RTK underscore user, and this is for RCH underscore user. And we see that uh, there's a separate security group name and a value associated to it. So this uh, brings to the end of the session, and uh, I hope I was able to convey some basics of Cisco Trust Tech components and uh, how they bind together as a solution. And uh, there's more to Trust Tech, I know, uh, in terms of Nexus, Campus, and data center scenarios are there. And we hope to cover them in, in, in the technology-specific Trust Tech uh, in the coming webinar, so just keep tuned and wait for updates on Cisco support community. I also want to thank my peers, uh, Minal, Fay, and Boo, um, who are answering your questions. And uh, now myself and Fay will take live questions if there are any for us. And I thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Ankur. Great presentation. And I want to thank everyone for participating in the event polling. And we're going to answer some of your questions our viewers have submitted today. If you can't stay with us for the Q&A, please be sure to click on the evaluation link provided in the chat to let us know how this session met your business needs and expectations. Also, in addition to Ankur uh, answering some of your questions right now, uh, also uh, Faye and Lee is going to help out along uh, with uh, Ankur and we'll go ahead and uh, answer these questions right now. Uh, the first question has to do with Nexus. Uh, on Nexus, can we use CTS on half duplex ports? Um, no, we cannot enable Cisco TrustSec on interfaces that are in half duplex mode. So it needs to be full duplex. Okay, thank you. And uh, another one here, um, does land-based image support GCM? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think no. Okay. And there's another one here on encryption, and feel free to elaborate on this. What type of encryption mechanism used by NACSEC? Um, so we have seen uh, in the config also we can use DCM. Uh, so it uses AES-128 and um, GCM encryption, and uh, GMAC is also a sort of, it's sort of HMAC that you can use for encryption. You can also do null if um, if, if your uh, service modules are not supporting it, and uh, go that way. All right, thank you. And what version of SXP starred, uh, is supported in looping detection? Uh, yeah, and we introduced our uh, uh, SXP uh, version four. With that, we started supporting loop detection. Uh, it was not available on version 1, 2, and 3, if I'm right. Correct. Okay. And another one here, can WLC act as a listener? Ankur, do you want to take that, or do you want me to? Hey, you, you can take it. it is so currently, all of our WLCs uh, are just SXP speakers. Okay. And here's another question, and feel free to elaborate on this. What is the length of header that MacSec appends? It's uh, around going to be around eight bytes. Okay, and another question here having to do with frames. What are pause frames? I'm not sure on that. Okay. Wait, do you want to take it? So, 
So uh, I think we'll we'll answer that on uh, as expert. Okay, yeah. If there are any questions that are held over um, from this session, we're, we are going to have an Ask the Expert session on the community, and our experts can answer your questions there. So if you don't get your question answered here in the webcast, please go to the community and post it in the our Ask the Expert session, and they'll be sure to answer that at a later time for you. Do we uh, support SGT on FCOE? I think no, we don't. Okay. And then, let's see, um, can we use SXP to use management interface? No. SXP cannot use uh, uh, management or if you go into the firewall, it, it's only going to use MGMT0 interface. Uh, you can still use M, your management interface to speak to our I server, but SXP will require your, uh, your one of the interfaces on the firewall to be used. Okay. And another question on MacSec. Uh, does MacSec have any throughput impact when implemented? So um, I have personally seen um, on a couple of cases that if you uh, if you do CTS dot one X and try to get your encryption keys from uh, from uh, the ICE server, then there are some delays. But um, there there is no uh, there is no official information of, on that on Cisco DOM and until that's fail, you have seen something. Just add to it. But I saw in a couple of cases, um, but that's about it. Uh, apart from that, there's no known issue. Okay, and we have a, a few more minutes to answer a couple more questions. Uh, how do we capture traffic to verify encryption on a link? Um, so, you're, uh, so is it related to MaxSec, uh, capturing the traffic? I mean, if, if if the question is around MaxSec, then um, we can do we, we can do things like debugging to do it. Um, uh, we can also do span capture, though personally I've not done it. Uh, but uh, but logically, if you do a span capture or if you do debugging, you will see some information around it. Yeah, I'll, I'd like to jump in for that one if you don't mind, Ankur. Um, yep. So for the actual encrypted traffic to see if it's like cryptoed fully, you have to put a wire tab on the link because it's going to get encrypted down in the PHY, not at the ASIC layer where the uh, span is occurring. So if you want to see that the encryption is actually occurring, you need to put a wire tab on there. Um, but the setup negotiation for like the encryption and stuff, you can see that in a span capture. I've had several okay. customers ask me about that one, so I just want to throw it out there for everybody. Thank you, Bo. Thanks, Bill. And one last question. Uh, is tag distribution and management only supported by ISE? So we have our ACS5 uh, also, which uh, supports tag distribution, and, um, and we do uh, the assignment of SGTs with ACS5.x also. All right, thank you everybody for submitting the questions and that's going to conclude our Q&A portion of today's event. Presence in social media keeps expanding, so we encourage you to visit the community and join us through any of these channels. Uh, we also continue to expand our reach in many different languages. We have also recently launched our Chinese community, so please be sure to stop by and browse through it if you speak Chinese. Uh, take a moment to rate the content of your peers' documents, videos, and blogs, and in doing so, you'll help us recognize the wonderful content that they contribute. And if you are looking for more information on IT and technical training, you can log into the Cisco Learning Network and take advantage of the technical webinars that they offer, and you can go to the link provided in the chat to learn more. And now we're going to answer today's trivia question. What does your New Year's Fitness Resolution and Cisco Trust Act share in common? And the correct answer on that was A, fitness company Beachbody partnered with Cisco to help install a next generation firewall to protect its data center and simplify security management. 
So before signing off, please take a few moments to complete your evaluation of today's session. This really helps us address your business needs and interests moving forward in the future. I also want to thank you all for um, your patience with some of the issues we had early on in the webcast, so thank you very much for that. And uh, I encourage you to join the Ask the Expert event uh, that will open up shortly after this webcast concludes, and then you can have follow-up questions on, on that, and our experts will answer those. And so this is going to conclude our session today. I want to thank Ankur for sharing his expertise with us today. I also want to thank experts Fayan, Bo, and Murnal for answering your technical questions. And I want to thank all of you for attending today and have a wonderful day.